We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. What if sex was not another thing to do on your to-do list? A source of anxiety about your body or getting it right? Or an occasional semi-guilty treat? But a path to self-discovery? A way to be more present in your body and to fly on a magic carpet with your lover? I think you know me well enough to know I want to inspire you to have less sex of the first routine kind and more of the second connected kind. After getting a master's degree at Oxford University, my witness today trained to be a research chemist, but has spent over 20 years leading workshops on intimacy and sexuality. Jan Day is the author of a new book called Living Tantra, A Journey into Sex, Spirit and Relationship. It's a truly inspiring read full of exercises I'm planning to use with my clients. So, Jan, thank you for a wonderful resource. Contrary to what people might expect, because when you say somebody's a tantra teacher, you imagine somebody being very comfortable with sexuality, your journey to connecting with your body and enjoying sex has been long and complicated. How did you end up divorced and still a virgin at 20? Ah, well, that was, it was my attempt to have relationship without sex because as a young teenager, through a number of complete misunderstandings, I came to the idea that sex was something horrible, disgusting, sinful, really not very nice at all. And if I could avoid it, then I should do that. So I ended up marrying a man who I knew would never have sex with me. And I thought I'd hit the jackpot. And I knew he would. It turned out, now I didn't know this at the time, but actually he was transsexual. So sexual things happened, but we never actually made love. And I mean, it is really incredibly sad when we actually realise some of these misunderstandings because you heard your mother talking about putting a bolster down the middle of the bed to separate her from her husband or your father. Yeah. And you understood what from that? I thought that meant that she had to keep him away from her because he was a sexual monster and was going to get all over her in the night and she needed to keep him off her. (laughs) And years later, I realised and talked to him about it that he was 16 stone and she was probably about, I don't know, seven. She was tiny and she would have completely rolled into him and got squashed. So that's why the (laughs) poster was there. But I was 10 or something. I was very young and I just made sense of it how I could. And, you know, sex was coming into play and the boys next door were saying disgusting things and it all sort of made sense together. Yeah, and it's really a pity. It was just a misunderstanding. So let's actually start to talk about Tantra. What what is it? So for me, I think there's very many definitions of Tantra, but for me, Tantra is the weaving together of everything. It's how do we bring everything together as one and leave nothing out. And when Tantra began, that meant bringing sex in because sex had been thrown out. In our time, it might mean bringing all manner of other things in, but it, it for sure means bringing sex in. And it for sure means bringing heart in and being connected with our bodies. And it for sure means bringing spirituality in so that everything gets connected. And it's like one big weaving together of everything. And I think in our society, in our culture, what we get about sex at the beginning tends to make it dysfunctional for most of us. I haven't met many people who grew up in the West with a healthy attitude towards sexuality. And I think one of the problems, lots of people would say, oh, yes, of course, we need to bring the body in. But what you're talking about is the whole body, not yes. just the genitals. As somebody who spent 35 years talking to couples about their sex lives, you would think that those were the only parts of their body they actually took into the bedroom. And you're talking about the whole of the body. 
Yes, being fully present in our body, including our sexuality, including everything that happens in our belly, including our our arms and legs that actually can hold us and stabilize us, including everything right the way up to our mind. Everything is included, but certainly our heart and our everything that happens in our abdomen is really important. And the exquisite touch that can happen, you know, like if you just touch an arm ever so gently. I mean, you can make love to somebody's arm just by bringing exquisite attention to it for minutes or hours. So yes, everything is available in our body and beyond. So how did you make this journey from being a 20-year-old virgin divorced 20-year-old virgin to somebody who's sitting here now writing books on living tantra. I mean, it's quite a journey really, isn't it? It is quite a journey. It has been. It has been really a life journey for me. So when I left my first husband, I I went very much into, into a very ascetic spirituality. Yoga, where we were going out and standing in the frosty garden and doing us pranayama and Everything was very much about purity. I was studying the Essenes, anything but sex, basically. And then when I was in my early 20s, I went to Oxford and I wanted to learn, I wanted to continue my spiritual journey, but I wanted to include meditation. And I got directed to a meditation center and it turned out to be an Osho meditation center. So it was anything but sitting quietly, except for the last few 10 minutes or so. It was very much about coming into your body. And there was a huge fight inside me. And eventually I thought, okay, yeah, I have to, I have to learn about myself. That's what really the message was. You've got to learn about who you are. You've got to get comfortable with all of who you are. But I decided to go off and do something different. I didn't want to be sucked into what was, I was still fighting it like crazy, like this cult. And, um, so I went off and did an Est workshop, actually, and ended up spending the entire weekend facing a sannyasin with a picture of Osho around her neck. So by the end of the weekend, I thought, okay, I get it, right. I go and do some workshops at the Osho Center. And it was an incredible beginning of a journey. And it, it was a long journey of gradually opening to my sexuality, exploring, and but being held, having a safe, supportive place where I could talk about what was happening inside of me and where I could make mistakes and and feel safe and learn about boundaries and learn about saying yes and no and really welcome my full aliveness. And then years later, I was living in Switzerland with another one of my teachers and I I went to see Amaji and I really loved her and I loved what she was, I loved her energy and and she felt like, she felt like an avatar and I, I really felt to go and live in a in her ashram in India. And then shortly afterwards, I realized that in her ashram, she separates the men and women. And as I reflected on that and the journey that I'd been on, which by then was probably about, hmm, I was probably 15, 20 years in, so I've skipped a lot. I thought, actually, my journey this lifetime is very much about healing sexuality, not separating men and women. And so I still love her, but that's not my path. And it was as if God had said to me, sex is wrong. And I've said, no, you're wrong. <laughs> Nobody can tell me sex is wrong anymore. I, I've done that bit. I've moved through. So it was like the final piece of, it will never go back again. So is there sort of one moment that you can share with us where you just actually thought, it's okay to enjoy my body. It's okay to have sex. Because I think a lot of people, particularly, mm-hmm. unfortunately, women struggle with, you know, they will sort of do it because they love somebody, but they're not actually doing it because their body wants and enjoys sex. If you do, you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yes, I absolutely do. Yes, and I had many of those experiences where I had sex because I thought it was needed, or but it certainly wasn't what I wanted. That was definitely part of the journey. There were many times when it was really quite nice to have sex, but actually, if I go back to one moment. There was a moment with a lover called Brian that I knew on Maui. And he was exquisitely present and incredibly sensitive. And I could journey with him in a sense. So when we were in touch and when we were making love, it felt like making love was about my whole being and my whole body. And it was like a dance and an invitation. It didn't have to go anywhere. And 
he could tease out exquisite pleasure, but he could also just be quiet with me and be going nowhere. And it was, he was probably one of my first real, real lovers. I mean, other things happened that went wrong and I didn't end up staying with him. But I think he was perhaps one of my first real lovers who met me and celebrated me and let me meet him so that we could dance together. So I was, I was probably 40 by then, or in my late 30s by then. And it was a time of opening. So a lot of, a lot of the gnarly stuff of personal growth had happened. And there was a, a grace that was beginning to come and a spaciousness that let, that let making love begin to really be a spiritual experience. And I love the metaphor of the dance. And sometimes in dancing, you go slow. And sometimes in dance, mm-hmm. you go fast. And other times, you actually stand still. And I mean, often, if you watch really good dancers, they pass the lead backs and forwards between each other. And sometimes one person's leading and then the other person's leading. Yeah. So I think that's a beautiful metaphor. Now, the thing that you do very much as step one is you need to have a deeper contact to yourself. And what's fascinating in this book, which is all about making love, is the first half of the book is all about connecting with yourself, which, you know, when I picked it up, even though I'm a marital therapist and I talk about sex all the time and I read books like this all the time, I was going, yeah, 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 yeah. There'll be first five pages, then we'll get onto the, the juicy stuff. And in fact, this is the juicy stuff. So explain to me why it's important to connect with yourself and why this is the juicy stuff. So if we jump straight to sexuality or straight to the other, before we've really landed in ourselves, we're not in our first intimacy. We're not there. There's not somebody at home to connect with. It's like we're limited. We don't have lots of space around us to to be able to flow and to have that dance. You know, we, we have like a kind of contraction and trying to make things fit the way we need them to fit. So the first part of all the work that I do with people is, yeah, literally coming home, finding your way into your body, finding your way into your feelings, finding your way into your nervous system, finding your way into being able to have difficult conversations, to be able to say yes and no, to resensitize, actually. Most of us inevitably have got very desensitized. So uh, quite apart from the trauma that happens when people have any kind of abusive touch, which unfortunately a, a huge number of people have experienced, there's also the desensitization that happens because we haven't had enough touch. And so we desensitize to avoid the pain of it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and all the little disappointments and and upsets that cause us to contract and hold our body a little bit more tightly. So the unwinding of that is about having a safe enough place that people can almost start again to feel like there are people around them who will love them, who are also wounded and hurt, that we can practice and make mistakes together. We can we can learn about saying yes and no. We can have permission to like what we like to bring who we are into the light, including our sexuality, and have it celebrated and honoured and gradually unwind. And so our whole body begins to relax and all the the, the pushed out parts and the disowned parts can be brought home and owned and we can relax into all of it so that we become more whole. And then we're there to be able to meet whoever we meet and dance with. So I can feel even talking about it, I could feel my body unwinding as I talked about the difficulties that that my body was tensing. And then I could feel unwinding as I can feel the journey that people go on. So first of all, we need to sort of get out of autopilot. And then we need to be sort of open to the mystery of what is about to happen. So you have a, a lovely exercise that I thought that we could do together here today mm-hmm. that will sort of get us a little bit more grounded in ourselves and actually is going to hopefully help us connect a little bit deeper as as well. And I was thinking that, you know, maybe people could do this exercise with their partner. Mm-hmm. So what it involves, it's called I Am Aware. 
And you might not be aware of the fact that when I record my podcasts, I have a video link with the person who I'm interviewing with my witness. So I can see Jan and Jan can see me. And perhaps, Jan, you'd like to explain how the exercise works. Yes. So we take it in turns. And what we're going to do in that moment, without preparing it, we're going to say, I am aware. And whatever we're aware of, we'll just speak it out quite simply. And the idea is that to notice that we have awareness sometimes inside our body. So it might be with what we're feeling physically. I might be feeling a gurgling in my belly. It might be with what I'm feeling inside, like some some fizzy tingling or some tension or some sadness might be in. So that's my inner world. And equally, it might be what I'm seeing outside. So I might be, as it is, I'm seeing some curtains that that are folding a certain way and I'm seeing the sky outside through the windows and the trees and I'm seeing you when I look on the screen and seeing your head (laughs) nodding and you smiling and laughing. So I'm seeing out and I'm hearing and I'm hearing the sound of your laughter and I'm I could be smelling, although actually I'm not smelling very much at the moment, but if there was incense or candles or wood smoke, I, that might be drawing my attention. So it's really, is my attention in my inner world or in my outer world? And in my inner world, it also might be aware in my thinking. So I might be aware of, oh, I'm aware that I'm thinking. How do I present this in a way that people will understand it? And it simply brings us present. Yeah. So I will go first. I'm aware of a small amount of nervousness, which is now receding. I'm aware of a strange little tickle on my right foot. I'm aware of a desire to laugh. I'm aware of noticing my shoulders just dropping a little. I'm aware of your red dangly earrings. I'm aware of a worrying thought, because sometimes my dangly earrings clunk in the noise and make a background noise. And I'm aware of a desire to reassure. I'm aware of my breath just settling. I'm aware of my breath too. And I'm aware of a sense of warmth in my chest. And I'm aware of a sense of relaxation. And I'm aware of the light shining against your head. And I'm aware of the silence. And I'm aware of a tickling just on my upper leg. And I'm aware of a falling deeper into connection. I'm aware of a stillness settling. And I think that's probably enough to give people a a sense of what it's about. But I think that people can notice actually how we became more aware of ourselves and more aware of the connection between the two of us as well. Absolutely. Yes, it was delightful. You can do it for quite a long time. It's lovely to do it at the beginning of a meeting with a partner, whether you're going to make love or just connect for the evening, to do it for 5, 10, 15 minutes even, and just drop and drop and drop together. And if you suddenly find yourself, you know, I'm aware of a sexual desire, you know, and obviously you're doing this with a lover and a partner, is that okay to talk about all of, I mean, of course it's okay, but I feel the need to say, is it okay? Yes, absolutely. I think when we don't have to bring big stories, when we can relax into ourselves, and especially to know, yeah, I'm aware of a sexual desire arising. And to know that our sexual desire is just our sexual desire. And actually, most of us feel sexual desire at all kinds of times, whether it's appropriate or not. Our sexual desire is just our sexual desire. Being willing to be aware of it and speak it doesn't mean anything has to happen with it. It just shows you this is who I am right now. Now, of course, there would be moments when it wouldn't be appropriate to say it, absolutely. But often it's a moment of sharing intimacy. But isn't it amazing how I immediately felt I had to ask for permission to mention things like that? I mean, it just shows how deeply that sort of message that sex is something that belongs elsewhere. um, And we go to the sexual world and then we come back from it rather than something, as you say, that's weaved together with everything else. 
Exactly, yes. And in fact, one of the things after the long, week-long workshop that I do, the Living Tantra One, at the end, one of the things that I give them to try and integrate the work is to become aware of their sexuality flowing in their body at all kinds of times. So, for example, even in the supermarket or at the farmer's market, when they're buying vegetables, take a moment and breathe, breathe down into your genitals, breathe down into your body and really see and smell the vegetables because actually they're really juicy and let yourself be touched by them and maybe turned on by them. And then you can get on with your shopping and just enjoy the feeling. So it can become very every day how you interact with the world. Your sexuality is just included and it doesn't mean that you're trying to get sex everywhere. It just means that your sexual juice flows everywhere and it brings a lot of beauty into the world. And if we suddenly, if we've been stopping the flow of our sexual juices all day long and then suddenly we arrive in the bedroom, we've, we've got an awful lot of work to do to get ourselves revved up. You know, exactly. if, if we've had an intimate moment with a, a red pepper during the day, you know, we, we're, we're sort of part of the way there really, aren't we? It, it is. It's like priming our body to just include and welcome and be friendly with this aspect of our being too, so that it's much more natural in it. And then also we're more relaxed with it. A lot of the the shame drops away, the, the fear of not getting it right drops away. So we can just, you know, a lot of people get nervous before sex about performance. All of, when, when sex is part of our normal life and integrated into our being, then that nervousness can drop away. The problem with sex is that it brings up all sorts of difficult feelings. And, and this is something I find with couples, some people use sex to keep down the difficult feelings. Yeah, that's both true. Yeah. And often you get a couple, at least couples that turn up in my room, there's one partner who's sort of trying to keep down the feelings and therefore is trying to be very cautious around sex. And then you've got the other partner for whom the sex actually sort of pacifies them and keeps down the feelings. And as you can imagine, the conflict there is quite strong. Yes, it is. So let's look at the sort of the kind of feelings that sex brings up or we try to use sex to bring down. The first one is fear. Now, how do we deal with the fear that comes up? So this is really where the base work, the foundational work that I do. So when I have couples come to me, I often encourage them both to come to Living Tantra One, but to come separately. So they do their own inner work. So really, we, we need to become so comfortable in ourselves that we can be with whatever arises, so that the, including the fear, so that if fear arises, we can be with the fear and hold it lightly rather than get hooked into a contraction with it. There's a lovely story from a Buddhist teacher I know who said he was driving with his teacher and they were going up this windy road and the driver was driving ever so fast around blind bends. And he said he was terrified and sort of felt he shouldn't be allowed to be afraid. And at the end, when they got out of the car, his teacher said to him, that was scary, wasn't it? <laughs> and he said, oh, like, it's okay to be afraid. So if I'm afraid, I can say to you, I'm aware I'm afraid. I can give it space. I don't even have to push the fear away. And if you feel fear coming up while you're in the bedroom and you're in the erotic kind of space, what do you suggest people do with that? You can say to your partner, I'm aware I'm afraid. I'm aware I'm feeling fear. Yes. I'm noticing, I'm noticing some fear arising. Mm. And it's part of the dance because actually... Everything can be brought into your lovemaking. There's no reason you shouldn't be sad, happy, delighted, fearful, anxious. It's all part of the dance. Nothing has to be left out. You're, you're saying that anger can actually be turned into an orgasm. It can, yes. Now, and, and here, now we have to be a little bit careful because sometimes people think anger and what we do with anger is the same thing. So the energy of anger is just a very strong energy. And actually, when we learn to work with sexuality, it's much easier to work with anger because it's a strong energy and so is sexual energy. So 
When anger arises, if instead of trying to get rid of it, cathart it, shout about it, do something with it, turn it into, uh, you know, like, ah, if I feel the energy of anger inside of me and I breathe it and start moving with it and simply let the energy of anger move through me, yes, actually, it can, it will tran- almost inevitably transform and change and become juicy energy. And the dance might change a little. It might become very powerful for a while. Um, and there might be a lot of rolling around and, and musculature moving. And the energy, it's the energy that we're just bringing in. I love the idea of rolling around. That sounds great fun. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there's one feeling that comes up with sex over and over again, which I can see I feel fear and I can see anger as being something you can weave in. I don't know how you would weave in shame because sex often brings up shame. Yes, it does inevitably. And it's it's actually one of the, the great reasons for doing so much exploration and for doing tantra work to dissolve the shame. Because if you can dissolve the shame of sexuality, you can dissolve the shame of everything else in life, in fact. It's like you've done the biggest one. Now, if you're in the bedroom and shame arises, you can actually share that with your partner too. So you can say, I notice shame is arising. Now, if you, especially if you've talked about this process beforehand and talked about that sometimes shame arises for me when I'm, when I'm in the bedroom, when I'm making love, sometimes shame arises. And then you can have a discussion. Your partner might be able to say to you something like, well, what, what can I best do for you when, when you're feeling shame? And the answer might be, you could just hold me tight. You could tell me that I'm a beautiful sexual man or woman. You could invite me to touch myself. You could tell me what you love about me and my sexuality. You could say, I, I get that you're feeling shame and I just want you to know that you're the most gorgeous man, woman in the world and and actually, I find your sexuality exquisite and delicious, and I'm so sad that that arose for you and that you got given that when you were young. You could practice together making love with the light song, because the light really dissolves the shame. I love that idea, light dissolves the shame. Mm. I mean, I'm just feeling, I'm, I'm aware of a huge sadness, not so much for myself, but for so many of my clients, this sort of shaming of their bodies. And, you know, I have to thank all the gods and goddesses for living in Germany, that if you go to the lakes around Berlin, everybody takes their clothes off and swims naked. And, you know, we all have different bodies and I think that helps a huge amount. But, I mean, the English, I mean, tell us a story, Jan, help us out. When did you actually become comfortable with your body and nakedness? Well, that was actually in a workshop with a lovely mentor of mine who ran workshops very, very similar to the ones I lead now. And we'd done a big process where we danced and shouted and all got very sweaty and and smelly. And then she said, right, just all go and have a shower. And it was the first time I'd been at that retreat center. And we went next door into the shower room and there was, there was probably about 30 of us. And there was one big shower room, like with like 10 shower heads and 30 men and women just stripped off and jumped in and had a shower. And at first I was like, what? And then I realized this, this isn't actually a big deal. Everyone's just having a shower. And that, that's, the, that's a very strong moment when I can remember thinking, okay, this just isn't a big deal. I don't have to take on. And it, it, it melted away. It just melted away. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. And I think we do need to be, I mean, I was very lucky. Both of my parents were sports people. So they were used to communal showers and communal baths and they just walked around. So, you know, we were far more comfortable with nakedness than most people. But it is so sad that we've all been burdened with all these negative feelings about our body. It, it is. And it's one of the big exercises that we do in the First Living Tantra workshop is around what are our feelings towards our naked body and really 
going ever so slowly and tenderly to discover the feelings that go with our own nakedness, with being seen, with how we should be, with how we shouldn't be, and befriending ourselves and making really holding ourselves in all the feelings that arise with that. So once we've actually discovered our own sexuality, we're grounded in our own bodies, how do we create we space? So with your partner, that you can open up this space that is not the usual stuff that we've done a thousand and one times before that we're both comfortable with, but a bit bored with, and (laughs) can can go into this creative we space. How do you open that up? So I think first with a partner, And even with a married couple who've been together for a long time, it's important actually to go back to boundaries, to be able to say yes and no, and to be able to get to a place where you're never going along with something, but you can feel safe in being able to risk saying whatever it is you want to say so that you can risk. Because if I can risk that I can say to you, you know, I'd like to, like, I'd like to have sex in the lifts next week. You know, something really pretty outrageous. If you're comfortable to say, no, I'm not up for that, then I can make my wild suggestions. Because one of the most beautiful things in the the book that that I just thought was just so true is about boundaries as well. And Mm. this is a recognition that we will, our boundaries will change even with the same person on different days, depending on how turned on we are, what's happening between the two of you and your personal mood. So in a sense, one of the sad things is that most couples have a sort of a blanket negotiation about boundaries. These these are our boundaries, come what may, day in, day out, rather than them being fluid things are going to change that, you know, today on this podcast, we will happily talk about this. But then, you know, if we did the podcast the next day, we'd be feeling entirely different. Our boundaries would be different and it would be a different podcast. So how do we get into that sort of kind of space that values the fact that, you know, I'm really turned on today and I'll, you know, you can do what you like. And the next day I'm actually feeling a little cautious and I need to be recruited. And so my boundaries are different. Help me out on this. So I think one way is to to start with the I am aware. So we're checking in with each other. We're getting comfortable with being able to say whatever we want to say and hear and say no. So if we feel free to say no and hear no, then that opens the space. And I think it's really important for, especially between lovers, to use appreciation and say what you do like. Because if somebody makes a lot of suggestions and you say no to all of them, at some point, they're going to have to hold themselves quite strongly to overcome the sense of rejection. So I think it's also important to say what you would like. So actually, no, I'm not really up for romping naked in the garden today, or I'm not really up for making love downstairs, but I would love some really tender touch and I don't know where it'll go or could I unclothe you really slowly? And let's see how that affects me. So I think, you know, that there's the yes and the no, and that gives freedom and possibility and safety. But the other piece, and this is where it can get misunderstood, it is nearly always true for women, especially in their 50s and 60s, once we go beyond menopause, that if you say to a woman, do you want to have sex? The answer is actually no, because she's not ready. <laughs> I'm sure it happens for men too, but it's certain, this I hear from women more, th- more than from men. However, if she takes, okay, it's a no and stays with the no, then that, that kind of cuts it too soon. Because the other thing that's true about women as they get older is that arousal leads to desire. So I know that, okay, do, you want, do I want to have sex right now? No. But if you touch me, if you stroke me, if you hold me, if we have a bath together, if we go and walk through the leaves in the garden, if we, then actually it's quite possible that my mood will change. So I have to be open to possibility and curious. So actually the answer is no right now, but it could change and it might not. So there has to be, um, like if I say, I'm open to possibility. I'm not making an agreement with you that it's going to change. So we have to allow a fluidity to arise between us. And I think a a big part of that is the we space that we create 
there's a sense of creating a body of love between the two people, creating the like almost a separate entity, this body of love that we create that is our relationship. And how do we nurture that? And how do we give space to that? Because that means that we're building that with everything that we do, which includes a- adventure. And, it- and the thing that I would like to convince every man about is that the sensate touch, the walking through the leaves, the slowly unveiling your partner, that is just as delicious and in itself can be just as beautiful if you really go into it as getting your rocks off, which is unfortunately, I mean, I I have a great advantage now being 63 that, you know, I've actually learned that the sort of bump and grind sex sort of lasts for about a short amount of time. But all the delicious things that come between that can last for hours. And unfortunately, and I think this is a particularly male thing, we've brought sex down to the bump and grind and we've forgotten about all the other things that come beforehand. And if you can, if both of you can be in that space, beautiful things can happen particularly staying in that space without rushing towards the bump and grind. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think it, as well as that, it's it's what happens afterwards. So if you have very short, fast sex, usually it doesn't stay in your body and have an, an impact for days afterwards. Whereas if you spend three hours making love and the whole day preparing for it and your whole life, including sexuality into your into whatever you do, then actually when you make love, it's as if your whole nervous system gets rewired into a connectivity, and it's a connectivity beyond just you and me. It's a connectivity with all life. It takes it into the spiritual, and that can stay with. It can certainly stay with me for days. So it affects how I am in the world. It means that my love making, the love of my love making, flows out into the world for days afterwards because. It's affected me on so many levels and connected me so wildly and deeply. And again, in, in, the, in the Living Tantra workshops, one of the things we try and do is give people a, an experience of being celebrated over and over again, where they have a long period of, of two hours where they're just being touched and pleasured within whatever their boundaries are, so that they can have a sense of relaxing and letting go completely and allowing the sense of the of the spirit to come in and create an openness to the mystery. We're going to come down to earth and look at some practical problems in a moment, but I think that probably we need to have both the practical down on the ground and the magic carpet ride, and we'll see if we can put the two together in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow. And that's why I've started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship, I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, and My Husband Doesn't Love Me Anymore and He's Texting Someone Else. You can find out more about these books along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. Sweet. 
So if you'd like to get involved in the programme, you can do it in many different ways. You can help us and become a supporter of The Meaningful Life. Go to www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. We will find out how to become a supporter and get access to the bonus material. And in there, you'll also find details of how to send a letter to us. So we have the antithesis of what we've been talking about, but... um, I think that there might be a connection. Anyway, let's have a look at this particular dilemma. My wife and I are currently separated and we're in a very painful and upsetting period. We aren't talking or seeing each other, but we're open to couples therapy and to see if we can work things out. I'm desperate to get things back on track, but because she is being so withdrawn and cold, my emotions run high. Every time we start talking and I don't hear anything positive from her side, we end up arguing and the conversation ends in tears. So, first of all, I want to say what a painful, difficult, and heartbreaking position that is. And, you know, I understand just how difficult it is for you at the moment. So, Jan, what are your thoughts? Yes, well, I would echo what you said. It's a very difficult situation, and yes, and extremely painful. There's a lot of hurt, inevitably, on both sides. And I think when people get into this situation, it's easy to forget that both are hurting and that the more that we go into that pain, almost the more we can become a threat to the other one, especially when we're blaming them, which inevitably at, at that stage we often are and wanting something from them that they can't give. Which for me, when I hear this, it sounds like both want something that the other one cannot give. And I think coming back to ourselves helps to be able to say, I'm hurting, I'm hurting, and just stay with. It's much easier to be received if if I can say to you, I'm really hurting right now. Rather than you're hurting me. Yes. Or even I need this from you. I need some appreciation from you right now. I'm hurting. I'm really hurting. And actually, I've got a feeling you might be hurting too. Oh, yes. I think we can take that one for granted. And it's a little bit like with the sexuality. You have to lean into where the other person is. So if they're cold and withdrawn, you have to say, I'm aware that you're cold at the moment. Would you like to tell me about it? Yes, yes. And invite them forward without moving towards them, without demanding anything. One thing that I do, and now of course people won't be able to see, I, I, I put my two hands up with couples sometimes and I say, you know, if, if this is two people and if I move closer to you than you're comfortable with, you're going to probably move away. Yeah. And if I then move a bit closer to you, you're probably going to move away. But if I, if I give you a little bit more space and invite you forward and say, it feels like you need a bit of space right now and I'd really welcome you but I'm happy to give you space and I let there be a little bit more. It's like you're inviting them forward and so nothing has to happen too fast. And in fact, you sometimes have to be with where the person is. If they're actually very negative, you have to hear the negativity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. What do you need to tell me? Yeah. Yeah. And the most incredible thing is if you can listen without being defensive, there are going to be two benefits. First and foremost, actually, when somebody is very negative and you hear them out so they don't have to defend their negativity, they will actually start to come round and say sort of, well, yes, but on the other hand, and they'll finally start to give the points that you want to make. Like, you know, we've had 20 wonderful years together and we've got two beautiful children sort of kind of stuff. But if you say that, then they... They'll push against it. They're free to say, but you stink sort of kind of material. Yes. I think that listening, learning to listen to each other is really, really powerful. And it's not easy, especially when there's so much pain and hurt. But learning to listen, and not only listen and say, oh, yes, I understand, but to feed back what you've understood. So I often use this analogy of like a red and a yellow ball, and I'm saying something is like I'm throwing you a red ball, but actually what you catch, because it's going through all your filters and experiences, is a yellow ball. So you need to tell me what you've heard so that I know what you've heard, 
And so that if anything is completely jarring, I can say, oh, no, actually, it's, it's like this. And then when you're listening, you, you're trying to, to see the world through their eyes, even if they're telling you that the sky is purple, yeah. to, to see what the world looks like from where you sit. So, and I'm going to do that as an exercise back. So what you're saying is that often you throw a red ball towards me and what I hear through my own filters is a yellow ball and that causes problems. And it would be much better if I could catch the red ball, see the red ball and experience the red ball through you rather than try and persuade you that the ball is in fact purple. Um, am I, have I got that right? Yes, you have. Yes. And I can feel it in my body that I can feel a relief that you've understood the way I see things. That's fantastic. And at this point, I can then say my bit, which is, I feel that I do catch the red ball, but something goes wrong because I feel I've, I've understood, but obviously from your reactions, I probably haven't and, you know, now I can tell the world from my point of view, but you really have to catch, I love your analogy, you have to catch the red ball before you can start discussing the colour of the ball, so to speak. Exactly, yeah. So, yes, I really get it that from your perspective, you've really thought you have been catching the red ball and you've been wanting to hear me. And now you see that actually, from my perspective, you haven't been, but I hear your willingness and how much you really want to to catch that, that red ball. And I can hear that you want to understand me. So if you can actually listen without defending, yeah, and that's effectively what we're doing, listening without defending, you're going to do two things. One, you're going to open up a space where you can probably go and get some serious help, which I think you most definitely need. But you're also showing what could be different. Yes. And you're doing it with your actions rather than saying, you know, I will go to the ends of the earth and do anything you want, but actually I'm not going to listen to you while you're being negative. You're actually showing some change. I hope that helped. And if you'd like some similar help for something you're facing, go to www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. So we're beginning to move towards the end of our time here today. So if you could give just one top tip for people to take away, what would be the idea or the tip that you would leave them with? And I'm going to take something that, that I would love everybody to know from your book as well. So uh, I would say, be curious, begin to look at the world with open possibilities, knowing that there are so many different ways to see the world. And what I've uh, taken that I think is the most beautiful question you could ask yourself today is, what can I give to my partner or do for them so they know I've attuned to them, seen them and love them? I'm going to repeat it again because it's such a beautiful question. What can I give to my partner or do for them so they know I've attuned to them, seen them and love them? And I don't think we often think of that question we might do it on Valentine's Day, but we don't do it on a daily basis. So, you've been a witness on The Meaningful Life, so I have to ask you, what makes your life meaningful? What makes my life meaningful is the work that I do with people, helping them to go on the journey that I went into to make friends with myself. So, contributing to supporting people to live with more love, with more aliveness, supporting them to love and be loved, that sense of opening the world of beauty to people is what makes my life meaningful. Well, unfortunately, this is where our conversation has to end, unless you're a supporter of The Meaningful Life. Because in the bonus material, I'm going to be getting Jan to share some of her best exercises from her workshops and from the Living Tantra book. And if you'd like to hear that bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. And we're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. 
Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.